thank you, Dr. McRae. Thank you for your welcome. I was warmly greeted at the airport this afternoon by one of your group. And I was told that the Maritimes are distinguished for their hospitality. And uh, so far, I think that's true. I'm waiting to see if something happens. <laughs> Looking forward to being with you, sharing this time with you. What I'm trying to do is get it straight. Get straight what it means to be a pastor. It's not easy. There are a lot of anti-pastor models around. When I became a pastor, I found I wasn't a pastor. And I started asking questions, looking around. I've been doing it ever since. William Faulkner once said that writing a novel is like building a chicken coop in a high wind. You, you grab any board you can and nail it down fast. Well, being a pastor is that way too. You get all the help you can, and when something comes by, you grab it. I've been ransacking the scriptures for years, looking for help, direction, counsel, and how to be a pastor. And somehow I missed Jonah. But about three years ago, I, I grabbed Jonah, sailing past in a high wind, and I've been nailing it down ever since, and it's been a wonderfully provocative story, uh, message, life, for what I'm doing, what you're doing. And Jonah is everybody's favorite. Children love this story. But adults are also fascinated by it. Outsiders who have minimal knowledge of our scriptures can understand a joke based on it. And scholars who are stuffed to the gills with erudition write learned articles on it all the time. <laughs> its influence can be seen in such diverse progeny as Pinocchio and Moby Dick. I got the book at both ends of my educational spectrum. I can remember flannel graph presentations of the story in my Sunday school in Montana. And 20 years or so later in New York, it was the first book that I was to read straight through in Hebrew. It was just as interesting in Hebrew as it was on phonograph. <laughs> <laughs> One of the reasons for this enduring popularity of Jonah is that it is a kind of material that invites playfulness. The book of Jonah, in both content and style, is playful. And so it incites playfulness in us. But this is a true playfulness and not frivolity, for there's nothing frivolous here. This is sober truth. But there are some aspects of life that can best be explored by the playful imagination. There's an honored strata of hermeneutic in our tradition that teases the text. The rabbis indulged in this under the cover of what they called midrash. I'd like to do that. Take this text, this Jonah text, playfully, but most seriously. <laughs> there are two broad movements in the Jonah story that locate Jonah's vocation along with the vocations of those of us who read him in spirituality. The movements combine to strike a blow against pretension. There's an enormous quantity of pretension in the pastoral vocation. Pretension accumulates on our vocations like barnacles on a ship. And the Jonah story pulls us into dry dock and scrapes off all this ponderous false dignity. First mo movement in the Jonah story shows Jonah disobedient. The second movement shows Jonah obedient. Both times, both movements are failures. Jonah fails. He never does get it right. I find this comforting. <laughs> Jonah is not a model I have to live up to. He is not a model that shows up my inadequacy. 
But what he does is he becomes a training in humility, which turns out to be not a groveling, but a quite cheerful humility. First, then, Jonah disobedient. When Jonah received his prophetic call to preach in Nineveh, he headed out the other direction to Tarshish. Tarshish is Gibraltar or Spain, some general, something exotic in that general direction, the jumping off place of the world. It was the gates of adventure. Jonah's journey to Tarshish is initiated by the word of God. And this is vocationally significant. He doesn't simply ignore the word. He doesn't stay in Joppa. He doesn't hunker down into his old job, whatever it was, anesthetizing his vocational conscience with familiar routines. He goes. An act of obedience, kind of. But he chooses the destination, Tarshish. Ironies abound in the pastoral vocation, and here's one of the most ironic. An an irony repeated generation after generation. Jonah uses the command of God to avoid the presence of God. Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And lest we miss the irony, there's a repetition. The next verse, Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. The sentence both ending and beginning with that phrase. Why would anyone flee the presence of the Lord? The presence of the Lord is a wonderful place. An awareness of blessing, a personal affirmation. The presence in Hebrew is literally face, panet a metaphor charged with complex and intimate experience. In infancy, our eyes gradually focus, and the first object they focus upon is the face. The face is our first vista. By means of the parental face, we know ourselves as ourselves, and in its expressions, we learn our place in the world. In the face, we acquire trust and affection, or in some terrible cases, rejection and abuse. Our formative years are spent looking up into the face. We grow up towards what we are looking at. So the metaphor, you see, pours out insights in our experience. The face is the source of our son under which we realize ourselves as intimately conceived and beneficently illuminated. These facts of the face, our experience of the face, develop into the metaphor of God's face. The feelings and responses that begin in the cradle under the influence of the faith develop in adulthood into acts of worship. Deliberate adventures into God adoration, Christ commitment, by which we escape the narcissistic isolation of gazing into our own ego mirrors and having reality defined by the squint of our eyes, the set of our jaws. Why would anyone flee the presence, the face of God, to look at that in the mirror? Well, as unreasonable as it seems, there is a reason, and it's this. A curious thing happens to us when we get a taste of God. It happened first in Eden, it keeps on happening. The experience of God, the ecstasy, the wholeness, the transcendence of it, is accompanied by a temptation to reproduce the experience as God. The taste for God is debased now into a greed to be God. Being loved by God is twisted into a lust for God performance. 
I get a glimpse of a world in which I am in charge. I think maybe I have a chance at doing that. So I abandon the personal presence of God and take up with a depersonalized, canny serpent. I flee the shining face of God for a world of religion that gives sanction to manipulating people and acquiring godlike, godlike attributes to myself. The moment I begin entertaining and cultivating the possibility of acquiring that kind of power, that kind of glory for myself, I most certainly will want to blot out that face. Flee from the presence of the Lord. Seek a place where I can develop pride and acquire power. Everyone is tempted to do this more or less. But pastors have the temptation compounded for them vocationally. Pastors are provided a substantial constituency in which to act godlike. Unlike many other temptations that are associated with elements of morality and so have visible social and physical consequences, this temptation is almost purely religious and effortlessly escapes detection, passing itself off as a virtue. If we speak the word of God long enough and often enough, it doesn't take a great leap of the imagination to take up the pose of the God who is speaking the word. And if that pose is reinforced by the admiring credulity of the people around me, and the benefits of power and adulation begin to accrue, I will almost certainly want to continue to flee the presence of the Lord. For that's the one place where I would be exposed as a fraud. And why Tarshish? Well, for one thing, it's a lot more exciting than Nineveh. Nineveh was an ancient site with layer after layer after layer of ruined and unhappy history. Going to Nineveh to preach was not a coveted assignment for a Hebrew prophet with good references. <laughs> but Tarshish, Tarshish, that was something else. Tarshish was exotic. Tarshish was adventure. Tarshish had the appeal of the unknown, furnished with Baroque details from the fantasizing imagination. Tarshish, in the biblical references, is a far-off, idealized port. It's reported in 1 Kings that Solomon's fleet of Tarshish fetched gold, silver, ivory, monkeys, and peacocks. Wonderful. It was a distant paradise. Well, this exotic escapism is familiar enough to people like you and me. We're called by God to a task. We're provided a vocation. We respond to this divine initiative. But we humbly request to choose the destination. We're going to be pastors, but not in Nineveh, for heaven's sake. Let's try Tarshish. In Tarshish, we can have a religious career without having to deal with God. So it's necessary for someone to stand up from time to time and try to get all the get the attention of all the pastors who are lined up at the travel agency in Joppa to get a ticket to Tarshish. <laughs> and right now I'm the one standing up. If I succeed in getting your attention, what I want to say is the pastoral vocation is not a glamorous vocation, and Tarshish is a lie. Pastoral work consists of modest, daily, assigned work. It's like farm work. Most pastoral work involves routines similar to cleaning out the barn, mucking out the stalls, spreading manure, pulling weeds. <laughs> None of this is bad work in itself. But if we expect it to ride a glistening black stallion in daily parades, and then return to the barn where a groom, a lackey, takes care of our seed for us, we're going to be severely disappointed and end up being horribly resentful. 
There is much that is glorious in pastoral work, but the congregation as such is not glorious. <laughs> the congregation is a Nineveh-like place, a site for hard work without a great deal of hope for success, as least, at least as success is measured on the charts. But somebody has to do it has to be faithful, has to give personal visibility to the continuities of the Word of God in the place of worship, the Word of God in the place of daily work and play, of virtue and sin, and pastors are the ones called to do that. Anyone who glamorizes congregation does a grave disservice to pastors. We hear these tales of glitzy, enthusiastic churches and wonder what in the world we're doing wrong that our people don't turn out that way under our preaching. (laughs) On close examination, and I've been doing some close examination, it turns out that there are no wonderful congregations. If you hang around long enough, you find out that sure enough, there are the gossips that won't shut up, the furnaces that malfunction, the sermons that misfire, the disciples who quit, the choirs who go flat, and worse. Every congregation is a congregation of sinners. And as if that weren't bad enough, they all have sinners for pastors. (laughs) Now, I'm not denying that there are moments of splendor in congregations. There are. Many of them and frequent. But there are also conditions of squalor. And why should we deny it? And how could it be otherwise? There's not an honest pastor in the land who is not deeply aware of the slum conditions that exist in the congregation. And therefore, the unending task that we have of clearing out the garbage, finding space for breathing, getting adequate nourishment, venturing into the streets day after day, night after night, risking life and limb and acts of faith and love. We experience this. We all of us do, week after week, year after year. Some weeks it's a little better, some weeks it's a little worse, but always it's there. These are the identical conditions that Moses faced at the foot of Sinai, Jeremiah faced in the streets of Jerusalem, St. Paul in the lecherous pews at Corinth, St. John among the bruised reeds of Thyatira. Denial of this incapacitates us for our real work. Avoidance of this separates us from Isaiah's insights and from David's pain. The hungers and thirsts that pull us into a Christ-crucified righteousness. Propagandists are abroad in the land lying to us about what congregations are and can be. They're lying for money. They want to make us discontent with what we're doing so that we'll buy a solution from them that they promise will restore virility to our impotent congregations. The profit-taking among these who market these spiritual monkey glands seems to indicate that pastoral gullibility in these purchase procedures is endless. And faced with the failure of these things, we typically blame the congregation and leave it for another. The devil, who is behind all this smiling and lacquered mischief, so easily makes us content with what we're doing. So we throw up our hands in the middle of it, disgusted, and go on to another parish where we'll appreciate where our gifts will be appreciated, our ministry to the Lord will be honored. Every time a pastor abandons one congregation for another out of boredom or anger or restlessness, the pastoral vocation of all of us is weakened. When I began my pastoral ministry in my present congregation, I was determined to stay there for my entire ministry. I was 30 years old. There was nothing particularly attractive about the place at the time. It was a cornfield. But I'd been reading St. Benedict. 
And I was pondering a radical innovation that he had introduced that struck me as exceedingly wise. In the community of monks to which he was the abbot, he added to the three standard evangelical councils, poverty, chastity, and obedience, he added a fourth council. He added the vow of stability. In St. Benedict's century, which was the sixth, the monks were on the move. The the monastic movement had started about 350 years earlier in Egypt, a few solitary men and women seeking a holy life. Through the years, this movement, this movement of monks, of solitaries, hermits, attracted to its ranks hundreds of men and women who wanted to live lives in such a way that they would redeem the world, save the age. From its beginnings, uh, as a loose gathering of hermits around some outstanding exemplars of prayer and austerity, the monks started developing communities of prayer. And there were foundations that were being made all over the Mediterranean, Syria, Egypt, North Africa, Greece, Basically, the monks were not group people. They didn't sit easily to rule. They were spiritual anarchists, most of them. In the third century, Pacomius had written a rule for community living. He gave a kind of semblance of order to these bands of intense and ardent seekers after God. These vows of chastity, poverty, obedience disciplined these men and women into powerful agents of social action and contemplative prayer. They really were remarkable groups of people. As they learned to live together, they developed high-energy communities. But their latent anarchism, combined with their quest for the very best, made them liable now to a new kind of spiritual wanderlust. It was not unusual for monks to set out for another monastery, supposing that they were responding to a greater challenge, attempting a more austere holiness. Pretty hard to be holy when you're living with this group of people. But just to cross the desert, 20 miles, they could do it. These quests were always a little suspect. Was it really more of God that they were after? By Benedict's time, this restlessness was widespread. They always called it spiritual questing. When the monastery in which the monk lived proved to be less than ideal, he or she went looking for a better one with a better habit or priors, more righteous brothers or sisters. They thought if they just got into the right community, they'd have a most effective prayer life, most effective ministry, and Benedict put a stop to it. He introduced the vow of stability. Stay where you are. Well, I was in my first years of pastoral vocation, and that seemed to me to be wise counsel. And I took it for myself. I had earlier been inducted into the pastoral career system. I'd signed up for career counseling, worked out career patterns, been to workshops showing me how I could work myself up the career ladder, It struck me at the time as glaringly immature, the kind of thing that spouses do who never grow up, leaving the partner when he or she proves no longer gratifying. Somehow, we pastors, without really noticing what had happened, got our vocations redefined in terms of careerism. We quit thinking of the parish as a location for pastoral spirituality and started thinking of it as an opportunity for advancement. And the minute that happened, Tarshish, not Nineveh, became the destination. The moment that happened, we started thinking wrongly. For the vocation of pastor has to do with living out the implications of the word of God in community, not sailing off into the exotic seas of religion in search of fame and fortune. One day I was reading an account of this intense and vocational spirituality that had been developed by the monastics 
who by this time I had come to admire considerably, and I came across a passage that anchored Benedict's vow in a harbor of substantial wisdom, wisdom that I was begin, beginning to find confirmed in my own experience. The subject was the spiritual vocation of the monk, but I was reading it now in terms of my own vocation as a pastor. And I started substituting pastor for monk and congregation for monastery. Let me read you just a brief passage of this with my substitutions. What is useless and destructive is to imagine that enlightenment or virtue can be found by seeking for fresh stimulation. The pastoral life is a refusal of any view that will make human maturity before God dependent on external stimulus, good thoughts, good impressions, edifying influences and ideas. Instead, the pastor must learn to live with his or her own darkness, with the interior horror of temptation and fantasy. Salvation affects the whole psyche. To try to escape boredom, sexual frustration, restlessness, unsatisfied desire by searching for fresh tasks and fresh ideas is to attempt to seal off these areas from grace without the humiliating and wholly unspiritual experiences of parish life, the limited routine of trivial tasks, the tedium, the loneliness. There would be no way of confronting much of human nature. Being a pastor is a discipline to destroy illusions. The pastor has come to the parish to escape the illusory Christian identity proposed by the world. We now have to see the roots of illusion that are within. The illusion that we can be dynamically in control of our spiritual life. The old familiar imperialism of the self bolstered by the intellect. Well, that's the end of my substituted quote, quotation. In taking on monastery as a metaphor for parish, I found a way to detach myself from the careerism mindset that has been so ruinous to pastoral vocations and began to understand my congregation as a location for a spiritually maturing life in ministry. I don't insist on that metaphor for others, for you. I might be the only one for whom it works. But I do insist that congregation is not a job site. The congregation is not a job site to be abandoned when a better offer comes along. The congregation is the pastor's place for developing what I'm learning to call vocational holiness. It goes without saying that it's also a place of ministry. We preach the word, we administer the sacraments, we give pastoral care, we administer the community life, we teach, we give spiritual direction. But it's also the place where we, we pastors, learn virtue, learn to love, advance in hope, become what we're preaching, congregation provides the rhythms, the associations, the tasks, the limitations, the temptations, the conditions for this growing up, what St. Paul calls maturing into Christ. These conditions are perhaps neither more or less favorable to the life of faith in Jesus than those of the farmer, the teacher, the engineer, the artist, the clerk, but they're ours. These are our conditions. We must be mindful of these conditions. Well, as you know, there's a widespread avoidance of this. Most commonly, there's either a glamorization of the parish or a repudiation of it. And I'm telling you that I mightily resent the people who attempt to lure me to Tarshish 
portraying pastoral work as being a chaplain to tourists on a religious sea, sightseeing among the Greek islands, stomping off at Rome for a bus tour of the ruins and museums, and then a final destination in this wonderful legendary Tarshish. Pastoral glamorization is a kind of ecclesiastical pornography. Taking photographs, skillfully airbrushed, or drawing pictures of congregations that are without spot or wrinkle. The shapes that maybe a few parishes have for a few short years. These carefully and provocatively posed pictures are devoid, completely devoid of personal relationships. That's what pornography is. The pictures excite the lust for domination, for gratification, for an uninvolved and impersonal spirituality. My image of the desire of a congregation was shaped by just such pornography tall steeple church with a cheesecake congregation. <laughs> and it's a little bit dismaying at this time in my life to tell you that even though I quit years ago, quit looking at the magazines, quit lining the walls of my vocational imagination with those pictures, I'm still, still vulnerable to the seduction. That's parish glamorization. Parish repudiation takes a different line. It's more subtle. It's often done by imagining alternate structures. How many of us, at the end of a hard day, visiting people who didn't want to be visited, <laughs> start dreaming of a retreat center where only hungry and thirsty people come. <laughs> or of forming an intentional community where only highly motivated people are let in. <laughs> or of escaping to some academic place where the complexities of sin and the mysteries of grace are no longer vocational concerns, where they're replaced by the still formidable but more manageable categories of ignorance and knowledge. All such fantasizing withdraws energy from the realities at hand and leaves us petulant. Not everyone's called to be a pastor. There are numerous and diverse ministries in the Church of Christ. But those of us who have been assigned the pastoral vocation must comprehend and accept the nature and the conditions of our work. The ordinary congregation is God's choice for the form that the church takes in locale. And pastors are the persons assigned for the ministry. St. Paul talked about the foolishness of preaching. I'd like to carry on a little bit about the foolishness of congregation. Of all the ways in which to engage in the enterprise of church, this has to be the most absurd. This haphazard collection of people somehow get assembled in the pews on Sundays, half-heartedly sing a few songs most of them don't like, tune in and out of the sermon according to the state of their digestion and the preacher's decibels, <laughs> awkward in their commitments, jerky in their prayers. But the people in those pews are also people who suffer deeply and find God in their suffering. There are men and women there who are making love commitments. They're faithful to them through trial and temptation and bear fruits of righteousness, spirit fruits that bless the people around them. Children are brought and dedicated, reared in the knowledge of the Lord. The dead are offered up to God in funerals in the midst of tears and grief. And we give solemn witness to the resurrection. Sinners honestly repent and believingly take the body and blood of Jesus and receive new life. But these are mixed in with the others. And more often than not, indistinguishable from them. But I can find biblically no other form of church. Nothing in Israel strikes me as being terrifically attractive. 
if I'd been church shopping in the 7th century BC, I think that Egyptian temples and Babylonian ziggurats or those lovely, lovely groves dedicated to Asherah would have been far more attractive. If I'd been religion shopping in the first century AD, I think that the purity of the synagogue or those intriguing rumors surrounding the Greek mystery religion or that Hellenic humanism with just a touch of myth in the background, any of those would have offered far more to my consumer soul. A bare 60 or 70 years after Pentecost, we have an account of seven churches that show about the same quality of holiness, depth of virtue found in any ordinary parish represented in this room. In 2,000 years of practice, we haven't gotten any better at this. You'd think we would have, but we haven't. Every time we open up the church door and take a careful, scrutinizing look at what's going on inside, there it is again. It's sinners. Also Christ. Christ in the preaching. Christ in the sacraments. But inconveniently and embarrassingly mixed into this congregation of sinners. And God chose to do it that way. So it's to be expected that in these situations they're going to rise rather frequently certain persons with designs to improve matters. They plan to purify the church. They propose to make the church something that can be an advertisement to the world of the attractiveness of the kingdom. With very few exceptions, these people are or soon become heretics, taking control of only as much of the gospel as they can manage and apply to the people around them attempting a version of church that's so well-behaved and efficiently organized that there'll be no need for God. (laughs) They abhor the scandal of both the cross and the church. They'll have nothing to do with the congregation in Nineveh. They're going to sail to Tarshish and start fresh, clean, gloriously. And I'm saying that it's the very nature of pastoral vocation to embrace this scandal accept this humiliation and engage in the daily work immersed in it not despising the shame and not denying it either to listen to many pastors talk when they're away from their parishes I think none of this was true conversations that feature wonderfully glowing stories about successful programs and slick conversions. I used to hear those stories and read those books and be impressed. But after a few years of careful Bible reading and congregation watching, I'm not impressed. I think it's far more likely that these pastors, if they aren't lying, are presiding over some form of Greek mystery religion (laughs) or Baal shrine or Babylonian religious parade. Four years into my ordination, I had the good fortune to be asked to organize a new congregation. It was 1962. My wife and I and our two-year-old daughter arrived in Maryland on the outskirts of a small town that was to develop through the years into a suburb of Baltimore. I was determined to develop a congregation that would be clean and intense. I was going to avoid all the trappings of idolatrous religion. I was going to sidestep this entire self-indulgent culture. I was going to live out the gospel and get some other people to do it with me in a gutsy commitment and passion. And it didn't take me very many months to find myself mired in something very different. I was in Nineveh. I was with people who were in trouble, sick with illusions, inconstant, bored, fitful in devotion. I had naively supposed that in the new congregation that I was gathering, we were meeting for worship in the basement of our house. We didn't have a sidewalk. It rained all winter, and we had people had to tramp through the mud to get in there. And they all knew we had to build a church that it would be 
financial commitments they would be asked to make, I thought that all that inconvenience and all that formidable financial stuff ahead of us would filter out all the half-hearted, the superficially religious, the god drifters. In a year, I had collected something far more like the congregation at Ziklag. I remember when David was out in the wilderness, Rasona, Non Grata, at Saul's court, gathering an outlaw band for survival. <laughs> this is the quote. All the worthless and discontent fellows of Israel joined him. <laughs> and they ended up establishing a base in Ziklag. Well, that was the biblical name for what I looked out on on Sunday mornings. I got the people who didn't fit in ordinary congregations, the misfits, the malcontents. So I had to revise my imagination. These are the people to whom I'm pastor. They're not the ones I would have chosen. But this is what I was given. What was I to do? Master, someone so tears in the night. I wanted to weed the field. And then I heard it. Leave them to the harvest. Let them grow together. I couldn't have told the difference between them. My untrained eye couldn't tell a weed from a sprouting grain. I still can't. I'm always getting them wrong. So I gradually gave up my illusions of Tarshish and settled into the realities of Nineveh. But not easily and not all at once. I wish I could boast before you that I kept my vow of stability, but I can't. Three times I broke it. Three times in the past 30 years, I have gone to the travel agent in Joppa and bought a ticket for Tarshish. <laughs> Each time I'd come to a place when I was sure I couldn't stand it another week. I was bored, I was depressed, there was no challenge left, there was no stimulus to do my best. All the things that I was gifted in weren't recognized or valued. Spiritually, I felt I was in a bog. That suburban culture was just a spongy, soggy wasteland, no firm ideas, no passionately held convictions, no sacrificial commitments. Preaching to these people was like talking to my dog. <laughs> they responded to my voice with gratitude. <laughs> they nuzzled me. They showed me affection. But the content of my words meant nothing to them. <laughs> the direction of my life was meaningless. And they were easily distracted. They were always running after rabbits or squirrels. <laughs> and when that happened, I knew infallibly that I was in the wrong place. I was a pastor, for God's sake, with the eternal gospel on my tongue and the radical love of Christ in my heart. And here I was surrounded by these nice people. <laughs> They were very nice. They were nice. They were kind to me. They've always been kind to me. They're friendly, appreciative. But their lives, their lives are shaped by comparative pricing and commercial comforts. And they didn't match any of the pictures in the travel posters that I'd seen on Tarshish churches. So I decided to leave for Tarshish. I read the travel folders. I don't know what they do with the Baptists, but in my denomination, they're called church information forms. I bought my ticket. That's called activating your dossier. <laughs> I lined up for the ship that was going to dock in Joppa and take me to Tarshish. I wasn't denying my vocation to be a pastor, but I was going to determine the locale. Assertion was a key word in my vocabulary in those days. I did that three times. Three times I broke my vow of stability. And each time, after making numerous inquiries, posting urgent letters, and getting nothing, I had to give up. Go back to the work to which I'd already been assigned. Nineveh. I never did get to Tarshish. But I can't take any credit either. I sure tried hard enough. <laughs> 
Each time I was rejected for passage. There was nothing I left to do but just to go back home and tough it out. But something interesting happened each time. Each time I did that, after swallowing my pride, accommodating myself to my frustrations, I began to find depths in the congregation I didn't know were there. See things that I'd missed. And then I began to see things in my own life that I'd missed. Uncover things that I didn't know were there. Each time I grew up a little more. And some of that growing up was in Christ. I've sometimes wondered whether St. Paul had occasional Tarshish episodes. We know he wanted to go to Tarshish. That's the Spain of Romans 15, 24. We know he made plans. And we know he didn't get there. He found himself instead in a Caesarean prison for two years. And then after a Jonah-like sea storm under house arrest in Rome, the distant place where he had supposed that he was going to do his most glorious work turned out to be a false lead. The Nineveh realities of his ministry were in prison and in shipwreck. I don't want you to misunderstand me. Looking for and accepting a call to another congregation is not in itself wrong. It's not, as such, escapist irresponsibility. God does call us to different tasks, to new places. Geographical stability is not a biblical goal. God's people and their pastors move about a good deal. Ur to Canaan to Egypt to Sinai to Kadesh for a start, then to Babylon and back back and forth between Galilee and Jerusalem, up to Antioch, over to Athens, across to Rome, and then all the world. There are plenty of times when sin or neurosis or change make it so difficult for a pastor and a congregation to stay together that it's necessary for the pastor to move to another place. A pastor who stays just stubbornly in such situations, falsely labeling what he or she is doing as faithfulness, cruelly inflicts, inflicts wounds on the body of Christ. But I'm convinced that the norm for pastoral work is stability. 20 and 30 and 40 year long pastors should be typical among us as they once were and not exceptional. Far too many pastors change parishes out of adolescent boredom, not because of mature wisdom. And when this happens, neither pastor nor congregation gains access to the very conditions that are hospitable to maturity in the faith. The first movement in Jonah is a movement of disobedience. The second movement in Jonah is a movement of obedience. The disobedience was that sail off to Tarshish. The obedience is walking across the desert to Nineveh. We quite naturally expect this to be a movement crowned with success, but it is not. Jonah obedient turns out to be as much in violation of the word of God as Jonah disobedient. And this is a much neglected story, much neglected detail in this story, which people like you and me cannot afford to neglect. Jonah is turned back from his disobedience by the sea storm and the rescue by the great fish. Saved, he goes to Nineveh, the place he was commanded to go by God, He preaches the word of God there as he was commanded to preach it. But Jonah is worse obedient than he was disobedient. Jonah is angry and vindictive. Jonah hates Nineveh. Jonah despises Nineveh. Nineveh is a most contemptible place and he has no love for it. Jonah obeys the command of the Lord to the letter. 
but he betrays the Spirit of God with his anger. Jonah, of course, by this time is a thoroughgoing professional. If he can't go to Tarshish, where he can be a pastor without the inconvenience of the presence of the Lord, he will preach with professionalized orthodoxy in such a way that he will not have to live in the presence of the Lord. When the Ninevites repent before God and are mercifully forgiven by God, Jonah's pouting displeasure betrays his complete indifference to God and God's ways and the people who have just become God's people. Jonah now has a professional reputation to uphold. He cares nothing for the congregation, but only for the literal and dominating authority of his own preaching. He's preached destruction in 40 days, and by God, destruction it had better be. <laughs> I find this a most alarming and accusing detail in this story because here it becomes even more autobiographical than in the first movement. For I am, and I think you are, more often than not obedient to my call. I do my work. I carry out my responsibilities as a minister of word and sacrament. I visit the sick. I comfort the grieving. I show up in church on time to conduct Sunday worship pray when asked over the church suppers, play second base at the annual church softball game. But in this life of obedience, it turns out that there's a steady attrition of ego satisfaction. Because as I carry out the work, I find that people are less and less responding to me and more and more responding to God. They hear different things in my sermon than I have so very carefully spoken, and I am offended at their inattention. They find ways of being responsive to the Spirit of God that don't fit into the plans I made for the congregation, which, if they would only cooperate, would not only glorify God, but redound to my credit as a first-rank leader. In myself and in my colleagues, I find that irritation, anger, and resentment of the congregation is the sin couching at the door every time I enter or leave the church. And here it is again. One of the oldest truths in spirituality, with special variations for the pastor. It's in our virtuous behavior that we are liable to the gravest sins. It's while we're being good that we have a chance of being really bad. It's in this context of being responsible, being obedient, that we most easily substitute our will for God's will because it's so easy to suppose that they're identical. It's in this context of being a good pastor that we have the most chance of developing pastoral hubris, pride, arrogance, insensitivity to what Jesus called the least of these my brethren, what Mother Teresa of Calcutta calls the poorest of the poor, and what in Jonah is named as persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle. When we're being obedient and successful pastors, we're in far more danger than when we're being disobedient and runaway pastors. Give us proper warning. The story shows Jonah obedient, far more, un- far more unattractive than Jonah disobedient. For in his disobedience, he at least had compassion on the sailors in the ship. In his obedience, he only had contempt for the citizens of Nineveh. One final note of grace, for there is a happy ending to this. The wonderful, gracious surprise here is that in both movements of Jonah's life, the disobedient and the obedient, God used him to save people. In Jonah's escapist disobedient, the sailors on the ship prayed to the Lord and entered into a life of faith. Here's the sentence. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord, 
Now, this is Israel's Lord. This is Yahweh. And made vows. In Jonah's angry disobedience, the Ninevites were all saved. Here's the sentence. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God repented of the evil which he'd said he would do to them, and he did not do it. We never do get a picture of the kind of pastor we want to be in this story, but only the kind of pastor we in fact are. Putting the mirror up to us, showing us our double failure would be too severe a burden. We couldn't take that. If it weren't for this other dimension in the story, that God works his purposes out through who we actually are, our rash disobedience, our heartless obedience, uses our lives as he finds us to do his work. And he does it in such a way that it's almost impossible for us to take credit for it. But also in such a way that somewhere along the way we gasp in surprised pleasure at the victories he accomplishes on the sea and in the city in which we have our strange Jonah part. Amen.